Dr. Robert Bilder directs the Consortium for Neuropsychiatric Phenomics, which is a team of more than 50 investigators, most centered at the University of California in Los Angeles. This consortium aims to understand neuropsychological phenotypes on a genome-wide scale through a combination of human research, basic research, and informatics strategies. Basically, Dr. Bilder is digging to create a fundamentally new understanding of how to look at personality disorders and diseases that have an effect on personality. In this regard, Dr. Bilder also directs and co-directs a slew of other important centers. But of the most interest to us, Dr. Bilder is the director of the Tenenbaum Center for the Biology of Creativity, one of the most important programs in the country involved in the study of creativity. So with that, it's a pleasure to speak here with Dr. Robert Bilder. Thank you so much for joining us here today, Dr. Bilder. You're one of the world's foremost experts on creativity, so I have a question for you. Sometimes my students will tell me, now, wait a minute, other people have solved this problem before, so if I think about it and figure out how to solve this problem, I'm actually not being creative while I'm solving this problem because other people have already solved this problem. What are your thoughts on that situation? Well, I think until you've solved the problem yourself, uh, you haven't exercised your brain and made the unique connections in your brain that are needed to solve that problem. So we could distinguish between those things that are creative for the world, which that may not be creative with respect to everything else that's been done before. But if we think about what's been done that's unique for you, something new for you, and that has value to you, then that satisfies the criteria for creativity. And it's important for your, your brain to do that in order to pursue other creative problems. Well, I couldn't agree more. Uh, so I, I'm glad you made that point. When you're trying to learn something new, and you speak publicly, sometimes you, like everyone, is criticized for it. What advice do you have for handling this kind of criticism? You know, someone uh, told me something that I'm surprised I only heard a few weeks ago. And they said, uh, leadership is the ability to disguise panic. And uh, I think that if I had to um, think of all the occasions I've had when I had, uh, you know, great concerns about what was going on or about handling criticisms. Um, uh, and I think that uh, it may only be through repeated uh, experience that one learns how to cope with that a little bit better. Uh, always difficult. Um, but I think if um, the, the only advice I can give uh, to others is to, you know, always adopt the same um, kind of curiosity uh, about your own shortcomings and your own uh, difficulty uh, getting the big picture and understanding the entire scope of the problem that you would apply to others and to, to any problem in general. I like that too, sort of be, be willing to accept discomfort sometimes because that's necessary. You know, some people would say that it's only when you experience some discomfort that you're actually accomplishing some kind of change. So to the extent that one wants to make progress, it's necessarily going to involve some degree of discomfort. That's the nature of change. Physical change in the brain has to involve some work, and that work has to involve some, some discomfort. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I'm reminded my old swimming coach used to say, no pain, no gain. <laughs> uh, yes, indeed. And that may also be true of the brain. Sometimes those old proverbs are really so true. Uh, you know, that's why they're proverbs. You've had some very interesting insights regarding creativity and being disagreeable. Could you give our viewers just a little bit of insight about that? Sure, sure. So it's interesting that when we've studied personality, um, it turns out that there are are various models of personality or temperament or character, but they pretty much all boil down to five factors, and these have been very reliably seen over time. And the way that I find easiest to remember those five factors is to use the acronym OCEAN, which stands for openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. 
And now when we've looked at the personality characteristics of people and then tried to relate their personality characteristics to their uh, degree of uh, creative achievement, we find that there are two correlations here. One of them is not surprising at all. Openness to new experience is associated with creative achievement. But then we find something that's perhaps not quite as intuitive. There is a correlation also with agreeableness, but that correlation is negative. So it means that people who are less agreeable or more disagreeable uh, tend to show higher creative achievement. And I think that we might consider this to be a facet of nonconformism. Uh, those who tend to challenge uh, the status quo, uh, challenge uh, models and don't believe things just because other people have said them. I think that these are, are folks who are more likely to be creative achievers. I think so too. That's, uh, that's a very interesting and it's a counterintuitive finding. Yes, usually people think agreeableness is uh, you know, a nice positive trait and indeed agreeableness is a nice positive trait. Uh, yet um, there are occasions when disagreeableness uh, can push the envelope, uh, help us to challenge uh, prior conventions and make the kinds of uh, pushes forward uh, you know, that, that are outside the box. I think sometimes it's just it's hard to walk that fine line between uh, being, a di being agreeable because things make sense and then sometimes stepping back and being willing to be disagreeable because it doesn't make sense to you and then sometimes you find out actually it does make sense but sometimes you're right to be disagreeable so finding that fine line of where to agree and where to disagree and being willing to disagree if you think that, uh, that something is not quite right I think that's an important, uh, important line to find yeah, it's, it's difficult to know how to balance um, the correct approach. And indeed, I think that's one of the cornerstones of creativity, just by following from the root definitions of, of creativity, um, which typically emphasize, on the one hand, whatever the product is, to be considered creative, it has to be new. But then it also has to be useful or valued by someone. So this involves a kind of attention between doing something that may be totally driven by your own vision of things and those things that are going to end up being adopted or used by others. So it means that you can create things that may be novel, wonderful, and strange, but if they're too novel, too strange, then they're not going to be considered wonderful by others. So finding this um, sweet spot uh, in the range between what you find to be the newest and most uh, valuable and exciting and what others uh, believe is, uh, I think that's a, a lifelong uh, process of, of deliberation and, and balance. That's so true. I, I think writers in particular, writers and inventors are both, they have to face what other people's opinions of their work are. And sometimes it's just surprising what they'll come back with. Something that you thought was perfect, a real gem, people will come back and, and give you insights that allow you to understand that maybe your perceptions weren't quite right. That's right. Yeah, I've, I've gotten that feedback, uh, you know, quite routinely. And, and I <laughs> may be a little defensive at first and then, you know, try to warm up to it and try to understand, well, what, what did they have in mind? Uh, any particular tips on how you learn most effectively? Ah, well, I think people vary a lot in terms of um, the degree to which they are dominated by words or images, uh, you know, some verbal versus visual kinds of learning styles. And um, so I find that uh, I do best if I can um, go between the two. Um, because I love words and language. Um, I was actually once accused uh, by my, my students of being a sesquipedalian and got a little plaque from them and, and I was embarrassed. I didn't know what sesquipedalian meant until I got the plaque. Um, and then anybody who watches this can, can look it up. Um, but <laughs> anyhow, uh, I, I love words and so um, there's a nuance there that I really like. But at the same time, I feel like I don't have a complete understanding unless I've somehow mapped it, graphed it, or visualized it. And so I like to go back and forth between, between those two kinds of approaches. Um, the other thing that I really like to do, and sometimes we've recommended this in uh, exercises to enhance creativity, is to do a powers of 10 exercise. 
And for those who haven't seen it, there's a great video. You can easily get it online. Um, we just look up Powers of 10 video. I think that will do the job. And it basically starts um, with an image of a man uh, lying in a hammock. And then uh, the camera zooms uh, 10 feet above, then 100 feet above, then 1,000 feet above. Goes by Powers of 10 until ultimately you're, you're exploring the cosmos in outer space. Um, and then it zooms back down into the man, then goes powers of 10 inside the skin, goes into the cell, goes down and reveals the molecules. Um, and then finally, and what's really mind blowing is how far you have to go when you start getting into subatomic space where you're really surrounded by nothingness. It seems even more vast than the universe itself. So I think that getting that kind of exercise, getting perspective, trying to figure out what's the higher altitude view, stepping back from a problem and thinking about, oh, well, why am I doing this? What's the bigger picture? Uh, but then also drilling into uh, individual facets and details by zooming in and zooming out from the problem. I usually find I get a much better idea of the problem scope and a different perspective on that problem. That is very worthwhile. I've never really thought of problem solving in that perspective. I think that's maybe a little bit what you do a bit subconsciously or just naturally when you get away from the problem and you get new perspective when you're just going out for a walk or something like that. But that's a, an interesting perspective, zooming in and zooming out. Yeah, I think the brain probably does some of this spontaneously and particularly during sleep. Because if you think about what happens during sleep, you've got a washing away of all of the conscious, top-down cognitive control over your thoughts. And it probably permits different neural networks to assemble themselves in ways that may make sense spontaneously, but are free from the guided process of our top-down mind. And so I think that that's one of the reasons why uh, people will awake from sleep dreams or other relaxed states when they're not thinking about problems and all of a sudden have come up with a solution. All the components were there, but it required a release, at least temporarily, of the constraints uh, that we've been applying to the problem to recognize a new solution. That may be how Auguste Kekulé recognized uh, the benzene ring, um, uh, you know, from seeing the, the snake biting its tail. I think it's sometimes I like to think of it as an octopus of attention and it turns off during sleep. And so the tentacles of the octopus can randomly go about and that's what helps create some of these innovative new ideas. Well, that's interesting. You were, I think you were reading my mind because when I was thinking about Auguste Kekulé who dreamt about a snake biting his tail, I was also thinking, well, what if instead of a snake biting its tail, he imagined a spider? Um, or it could have been an octopus, uh, then we'd have a completely different structure uh, of organic chemistry uh, before us. We would never have discovered the benzene ring. Well, there we go. Well, that's what they say. Uh, insights that arise from the subconscious like that are, they're, they can sometimes be invaluable, but you always got to check them because sometimes they, they may seem right, but they're not actually right. That's right, yeah. And there, you know, I'm mindful of, speaking of spiders, the fantastic experiments that were done uh, in the early investigation of LSD, the hallucinogen, where uh, different drugs were given to spiders and see what impact it had on their web-making skills. And uh, while many people felt that they became incredibly creative while under the influence of LSD, and while many people felt they had great insights while they were under the influence of LSD, uh, the spiders, it turns out, made really lousy webs when they were under the influence of LSD. And I think a lot of people who had been putting down what they were thinking about at the time that they were doing LSD found later when they were uh, no longer under the influence that the products that they had created were not exactly what they'd hoped. That's, that's, I think that's true. Uh, there's, there's interesting perspectives from history of different people's insights whilst under drugs and not under drugs. And sometimes I think it's, it's actually surprisingly good, but other times it's surprisingly terrible. So, uh, so there's definitely a mixture there. This is, this is true. I was just uh, reviewing with a class different kinds of visual representations of dualities or balances between opposing forces 
So we were talking about the yin yang symbol, uh, the Tibetan eternal knot. Um, but one of the symbols that's one of my one of my favorites, uh, uh, probably because I understand it the least, is the intersecting gyres or intersecting cones that were described by Yeats uh, and his wife George. Um, and those those images were probably created while they were under the influence of opium. I will definitely have to go look those up now. So, Dr. Builder, I I, I so appreciate your. You're an abecedarian polymath. <laughs> so I greatly appreciate your insights here. And on behalf of all the students of Learning How to Learn, I, I thank you. Thank you, Barb. It's always great talking to you.